for joining us this morning. I'm Ruth Ellen Alinsky. I'm the center director here at the Small Business Development Center at Yavapai College. And this morning's session is on business planning for both new and established businesses. I want to thank you all again for joining us. A um, couple things I want to just go through quickly is just a little bit about webinar protocol. So if you, we really want this to be an interactive session this morning. So if you have questions or you have comments or you want to um, connect with one of us, please use the chat feature, which should be located at the bottom of your screen. And we will, uh, we will be monitoring the chat feature ongoing throughout the presentation this morning. Um, again, we encourage you to make this interactive. So don't wait until the end to ask your questions. If you have questions at any time, feel free to, again, use that chat feature. Uh, as mentioned, when we first got started, we are recording the session today. So we will be sending that out to people on the call this morning and also to those uh, that may not be able to attend this morning. So it's a great way for us to um, uh, archive our recording this morning for people to use on down the road. So uh, I want to do a quick introduction of my colleagues. Um, Marie Plachowski Beals is a business analyst here at the Small Business Development Center. And Fanny Zapata Sanchez is our program assistant. We have one other team member, Hillary Strong. And um, we're all here to support you in whatever stage of business that you're in. So again, welcome to our presentation this morning. So what is the agenda for today? So in this session, we're gonna talk a little bit about why business plans are important. And as you see from the title, business plans are important for both business uh, owners or entrepreneurs that are just starting out or those that are already established. Even if you're a 10 or 15 or 20 year old business, sometimes it's good to go back and look at your business plan, dust it off, revisit your goals. Yes, Marie. Uh, you're on mute. Yep, sorry. Your uh, slides are not advancing. So that you don't see the agenda slide? I do see that one. Okay, we're okay. still going through that. Okay. Um, we're going to go through a program called Live Plan. This is an online business plan writing tool that the Small Business Development Center can offer our clients at no charge. And our excellent expert team can walk you through this process even after today's session. So if this is something you're interested in and you're not already an SBDC client, you can easily register. And we'll go through that at the end of the session today on how to, to both register and utilize the live plan tool. We obviously want to take your questions. So writing a business plan in whatever stage you're in can be overwhelming and it can also be confusing. And we wanna answer your questions today and also build relationships with all of you so we can help you through this process. And then, as I mentioned, we'll also talk a little bit about how to get registered so you can utilize this, this tool for free. So the first thing uh, I, wanna, I wanna do, and I do want you all to use the chat feature, is just you know type in the chat, why are business plans important? Why do you think business plans are important? Anything coming through? Not yet. To give an outline of your business to your investors, that is absolutely true. Um, you can't reach a target you don't set. Absolutely, target market we're gonna talk a lot about today. That's a big section of your business plan. If you're looking for financing or you're needing access to capital, it's great to have a business plan. Yes, Michelle, it helps establish goals and how to get there. Great, these are all good, good reasons. So some of these are mentioned, but these, this is a, a short list that I've come up with, which is it just defines your business. It helps you articulate what you're trying to do. It helps you take what's in your head, which might be very clear in your head, 
and explain it to other people who may be able to help you move your business forward, right? It helps you create strategy. And uh, several of you mentioned goals. Yes, we want you to be able to set goals, whether short-term or long-term, and really frame your business and be able to um, create steps and a process for reaching those goals. We talked a little bit, somebody mentioned target markets. This is probably one of the most important sections of your business plan. And we're gonna go through that a little later in the live plan tool. I think business plans also help you analyze your numbers. And live plan has a really great forecasting section where, you, where we can help you walk through the process of creating projections, financial projections for your business and really analyzing those numbers and looking at the what ifs. So you might create your financial plan, just know that it is a moving target, right? And we may be able to go back in there and say, okay, what if I raise my, my prices by 10%? Or what if I reduce my direct costs by 5%? And that's what's really great about this tool is you'll really be able to analyze those numbers in a clear way. We talked about setting goals and then of course, preparing your, you for access to capital. Here's the thing about that. Even if you're not looking for a loan, even if you're not thinking about uh, needing access, you're going to approach your business in a very entrepreneurial way. Having a business plan is a great first step in setting you up for success and outlining your goals and what you need to do to move your business forward. So I'm going to do a quick poll, try this feature out, and I'm going to have you all just let me know who out there has a business plan and who out there doesn't. So hopefully a little box has popped up on your screen and you're able to answer the question, do you have a business plan now or not? And that just gives us a good idea of who our audience is and uh, what, your, what your needs are. Okay, I think we've collected almost everybody. I'll give you a few more seconds. And then I can share the results with all of you so you know also who's on the call this morning. Okay, I'm ending and I'm gonna share now. Hopefully the results have popped up. We have four yeses and seven noes this morning. So um, a little higher percentage of people that don't have a business plan yet. So that gives us a really great idea of who's in the room. For those of you that have created a plan, maybe you're joining today to find out how to revisit that plan. And, or maybe you're looking to um, make it better or um, make it, as we say in the SBDC, make it bulletproof so that you're ready to approach a lender or an investor or take your business to the next level. So that's great. Thanks for sharing that, everybody. Okay, using a plan as an established business. So even if you are already established, it's still incredibly important that you put a plan together. And again, as I mentioned, they are a moving target. It's gonna change over time. You're gonna come up against uh, decisions that maybe you didn't expect, and you're going to have to move your business based on those opportunities and decisions that you're making in the moment. And that can change your plan. You know, right now we're facing a lot of challenges. Businesses are facing uh, challenges with supply, right? Well, that may make you have to change direction with your business. Over the last couple of years, we had a lot of clients have to change direction with their delivery of their service, right? The pandemic caused a lot of changes in our service delivery. Well, it was a good time to revisit that business plan and say, okay, how can I do this differently? How can I diversify my revenue streams? How can I deliver this service or this product in a different way and still generate the revenue I need to keep moving forward? So we all need to be thinking about, especially established businesses, how do we do that? I wanted to show this chart this morning, and this is from Palo Alto Software, who is the company that owns uh, the business plan writing tool live plan. And this is what they found in some of their research with companies with business plans versus no business plan. And again, 
you can see that capital is a couple of them, but having a business plan also just helps you grow your business because it helps you understand behind the scenes what's going on in your business. Writing a business plan is a great way to work on your business and kind of step back from the day-to-day -day tasks and the many hats of entrepreneurship and help you keep moving your business in the direction that you want. So as I mentioned, uh, using a plan as an established business, it's also a way to document changes and new goals. Uh, it helps you analyze new products or services. It's a great way to forecast and project what is coming based on historical financial information. And again, it helps you access capital if, if you're looking to go that direction. Are there any questions so far? And if so, please feel free to put them in the chat now because we're gonna be going, we're gonna be moving screens over to live plan. We're gonna show you this tool in real time. There aren't any in the chat right now. Okay. Marie, anything to add before we jump into the tool? No, I think you're covering it. I'll, okay. I'll jump in if I see something. Okay, great. So um, as I mentioned, this is, uh, we're gonna dive into the tool live plan. I'm gonna stop my share and move over to the internet here. So everybody hold tight. So some of you on the call may already be SBDC clients and you may already have access to a live plan account. If you are not an SBDC client yet, that's okay. But once you are, we can share an account with you. And what's one of the very great things about this tool is that you receive an invitation on your end. You can work on your business plan and then you can reach out to me or Marie or Fanny or Hillary and say, hey, I've been working on my plan. Can you review it? And we can see it on our end. So it's completely private between our team and you, but it makes it very easy for us to review the, the things that you've been working on. So we're just going to start here with this sample company. And I want everyone to look over here on the left side of the screen. And we're going to be working in these top three sections here. The pitch page, which is a snapshot of your business. The full plan, which is, is the narrative. And then the forecasting tool here is where you'll be projecting, making financial projections for your business. The plan section here is where we're gonna start because I always recommend that you work backwards. So we're gonna start with the full plan. We're gonna work back to the executive summary, and then we're gonna work back one more step to this pitch page, which again is just a, a single snapshot. What's good about working backwards like that is as you do your brain dump into the full narrative, your plan is going to become more and more clear, and you're going to know which are the key points that anyone reviewing your plan would want to know, okay? And the idea here, again, is not quantity. This isn't about writing a, a book. This is about bringing clarity to what you're doing. So you want to be clear and concise. You want to articulate uh, what you're doing and how you're going to do it. And if you're going for a loan, if you're looking for capital, how you, you want to define how you're going to pay that loan back. So I'm going to open up the plan section here first, and we're going to go through different sections of the plan. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the forecasting. And then I'll show you a little bit more about how to fill in this pitch page once, once we're through those. Questions so far? Nothing so far. Okay, great. So I've just hit this uh, plan tab and here we have executive summary, opportunity execution. So we've got another line of tabs here. If I click on executive summary, it opens up different sections, right? These are still empty. I'm gonna skip this section 
Okay, and I'm going to click on opportunity here. Now, each of these sections has a little edit button off to the right. If I click on that, what happens is a little area opens up that's just like a Word document. You can add photos, you can add links, you can do a bulleted list, which in some of these sections is actually more helpful than a full uh, paragraph narrative. So that's sometimes helpful. And over here on the left is a little bit of a description of what it is we're looking for in each of these sections. And then once you fill this in, you're just gonna hit I'm done and it will save. And then what's cool is see down here, this little comment section, I can say, have you thought about data to back up your problem? And I'm gonna hit post and you're gonna get a little notification in your email that says, Ruth Ellen has just sent you a message, right? So that's how we can provide feedback to you ongoing as you work on your plan. So as mentioned, the first section here is problem. What is the problem that you're solving? And this can be many different things depending on the stage of your business. Maybe the problem if you're a new start is that uh, there is a gap in the market that you're filling. Um, if you're a growing business, this first item here, maybe you've plateaued and you're looking to expand or you want to add a product or you want to hire new employees. Um, as I mentioned, there's maybe there's no product or service in the market that you have an idea for. Maybe you need to expand your delivery to ordering online, or maybe your website isn't up to par. That would be a problem we're solving. Maybe it's that you are in a tiny little retail space and you cannot meet the demand right now and you need to uh, expand your space or move to a new location or purchase a building. So you're wa wanting to identify what it is, what's the problem here? And then moving right into the solution. And what I like to say here is you are awesome in a hundred thousand different ways and you want to describe that here. Maybe it's exceptional customer service. Maybe it's a product uh, or service that, again, isn't in the market. And what what is that? Describe it and how you are qualified to be bringing this product or service to market. Uh, it could be a high quality product that no one else has. It might be um, how you have diversified or changed your business. Maybe your, rev maybe your revenue streams are now online and um, that is opening up new markets for you, okay? So your solution here again is, is what, what, how you're gonna solve that problem that you just mentioned. And then we move into target market, which came up in why business plans are so important. And this, I would say, is really one of the most important sections of your business plan. Who is your ideal customer? Who is it that will buy your product or service? And one of the biggest misconceptions that I hear from clients is like, anybody, everybody's my client, right? That actually is not always true because uh, people, you know, different customers <laughs> have different desires and needs, right? It might be it might be a different age group. It might be a different kind of consumer, but you need to really think about who is that target market. Because if you are, uh, if your target market is between the ages of, let's say, uh, 15 and 25, and all of your marketing you're doing on Facebook, guess what? You're missing your target market, right? So by defining your target market, it's gonna help you understand who you should be marketing to. And that will change your marketing plan. Yes, Marie. Okay, um, well, two things. Um, one, I would like to add about that target market before I go to the question that Jerry has posted. But, you know, um, if you are, for instance, your client is uh, someone that, if you have a restaurant and it's a fine dining restaurant, well, 
it can't be everyone because not everybody can afford to go to that restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. and, or uh, they have to budget some of their money for the restaurant for their anniversary dinner and some for groceries for the week. So that's how you have to think of it, that it can't be everyone because some of the people that are out there have a budget and you may not fall into their budget. Um, and now Jerry asked the question, I noticed that on this tool that it shows a revenue forecast. If you're entering a new market or business, how are you supposed to estimate these figures? And that's a great question. So, and we get this question a lot actually. And when we get into forecasting, we can talk about that more. But if you are if you are a new start or you're starting a new uh, business and it's maybe a product that's never been to market, the biggest thing that you can do is is research a broader industry like data, which um, our team also has the ability to help you with through some different tools that I can talk about later. But um, you know, and if you're looking for a loan, a lot of times as a new start, lenders understand that if you're starting a new business, you don't really have anything to base your numbers off of. And so you have to do your best to, uh, to identify data or like products or even industry trends or um, economic trends happening, consumer trends that are happening that would align with what you're trying to sell. Hopefully that makes sense. Thank you. And then uh, Rick did add, um, put a comment in that it really helps to narrow down your ideal client avatar as much as possible and mark it as if you're speaking directly to that person. That is absolutely true, Rick. Thank you for that comment. And, and to, um, kind of in line with that, I would also say sometimes you may have a couple of different markets, right? It's not always just one, but you do want to identify that avatar, you know, as much as possible, dial that in so that again, you know exactly who you're talking to. Yes. And to Marie's point, it could be age. It could also be income level. So we've seen a lot of business plans come through that say my product is for someone who has a uh, disposable income and that generates around, you know, over $100,000 a year in income, right? So it may be a luxury product or a luxury item and would require higher level income for, for them to purchase this item or this service. So great point. Okay, any other questions on that? Not right now. Okay. And as you see here, use data to support your case. So again, if if you don't know who your target market is, you know, that would be a great opportunity for you to schedule an appointment with us and we can talk you through who that is and how you would target them. Okay, the next section here is competition. This is another great uh great point in your plan who are the competitors in this industry and again that another another uh kind of funny response from people is i don't have any there's no competitors i don't have any competitors I, i'm the only one doing this particular thing well the reality is if um if let's just say you're a tour company and you're creating experience for for somebody coming to the verde valley or to Yavapai County, um, the reality is if you weren't in the market, people coming to visit are still looking for some sort of experience. So while there may not be a direct competitor uh, doing exactly what you're doing, you want to think about what choices people have as alternatives in the market. So again, it may not be a direct competitor, but it may be uh, somebody doing uh creating an experience or um uh doing something that someone someone would choose if you weren't in the market hopefully that made sense now you can also list competitors directly so if you're starting a coffee shop you can say well there's only two coffee shops in the uh area where i'm going to be and they are you know uh 
bean coffee and you know xyz coffee but this is also an opportunity for, for you to say how you are different what are your differentiating factors so while you do have direct competitors in your region or area maybe you're offering a, a different uh, menu item that is going to be a bigger draw for customers and you want to mention that here so use this opportunity to discuss your differentiating factors. What are they? And if you don't know what your differentiating factors are, that's another key thing that you should really try to identify. Is it price? Is it a specialty product? Um, is it how you do your packaging? Are you a sustainable business and you have these core values that align with a certain group of people? Those are all things that you know, especially in today's market, consumers are looking for. They want to support companies that, uh, you know, support nonprofits in the community, or um, maybe they uh, support educational uh, uh, programs for kids or what have you. So think about what are the differentiating factors you have, whether it's it's your core values or whether it's actually something in your menu or product line that is different. Questions on that? On competition nothing in the chat okay next section is advantages this can be anything from having a location right on a main uh, highway or uh or um road where you can have great signage and uh, be a draw to people coming who are just driving by it could also be resume type skills and experience maybe uh maybe you're starting a coffee shop and you've worked in a coffee shop for 15 years and you have held every position there is in that coffee shop and now you're ready to go out on your own that's an advantage that sets you apart you're not somebody just coming and being like well i've been a um you know a computer repair service person for 30 years and now i want to open a coffee shop because there, that doesn't align, right? So we want to be thinking about, you know, how does your skills and experience, what do you bring to the table that can support this business? So maybe it is, maybe it's years in the industry. Maybe you have a very unique product that hasn't been brought to uh, the market before. Um, the other big one, which came up a little bit earlier, is this idea of proof of concept. So I believe it was Jerry asked the question about um, you know, what if you're bringing something that's that's never been to market before, right? Um, how do you estimate um, or, or project your, your financing? If you're looking for a loan, you're going to be much better positioned if you can get your business at least started and prove the concept. And I know I keep going back to the coffee shop example, but if you know if you are going in as a new start to the bank and you're like yeah i need a hundred and fifty thousand dollars i'm going to open this coffee shop on it's a great location you know i have cash in the bank everything else is in line but the bank is going to say how do you really know it's going to work how do you know you're going to have x number of people coming in your door every day because you haven't actually gotten started yet right so if you can think entrepreneurially about your business and try to get it at least started, and then you can generate, let's say, three months of, of historical financial data, you're going to be better positioned for a loan than if you just go in and say, I have this idea and I think it will work, right? So you're, you're going to try to create that demand. It looks like Jerry has another question here. Is there a rule of thumb in determining the size of a region in which your business needs to uh, aware of, be aware of for competitors. Are there any stats available on average distance a potential customer will drive for a service? That's a good question. Um, I honestly think it depends on the product or service, right? Um, if it, and does the customer have to to go anywhere to get the product or service that you might be talking about. Because if they can find you online and, and um, uh, 
you know, create a relationship or, or work on a relationship with you prior to having to come to you and you have something that they don't have, I would say, you know, they, they would likely do that. But um, I, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a rule of thumb, but I would say uh, if, for example, here in the Verde Valley, there's tasting rooms now popping up everywhere, right? And a lot of people are saying, we're saturated. And it may be very difficult if you, if you want to start a tasting room to come into the Verde Valley and start a tasting room because there's already 15 or 20 <laughs> in the area, right? Um, so your, uh, your projections would need to reflect that kind of competition. Hopefully that's helpful. I wouldn't say there's a rule of thumb, and I would also say that it would it, that would be industry specific. I mean, I think you can have um, more than one coffee shop in an area and still do okay, right? And it, it, it also depends on those differentiating factors. Maybe you're a coffee shop, but you have this um, specialty donut that nobody else has and everybody comes there for that specialty item. And then in the meantime, and in addition, then buys your coffee at the same time, right? So you have to think about those differentiating factors as a draw uh, away from your competitors. Okay, so that's the first section. We're gonna move on to execution. And these two sections, this is marketing and sales. Your marketing would be, again, it can be anything from social media, a really strong website and online presence. It can be memberships to business associations and your chambers of commerce. It can be just generally good signage. It can be networking in the community and building connections and partnerships with maybe other area businesses. Those are all marketing strategies. And then your sales plan, word of mouth, of course, is, a, is also a marketing strategy. And we have many businesses, uh, services specifically that, that generally just, uh, their, their only marketing is word of mouth, which means they do a really exceptional job at what they do. And that customer tells their neighbors and friends and whoever else in the community. And I'll tell you a lot of trades, uh, people in the trades and, and service industry, this is really important for their business strategy. So if you're a service-based business, word of mouth, the way that works is creating an exceptional experience and being Johnny on the spot as far as customer service goes. And then the next uh, section here is sales plan. What is your menu? Doesn't mean you have to be a restaurant, but what services are you providing? Is it a la carte or do you have you know, packages? Um, if you're a service, let's say you're an HVAC company, is it a installation plus um, three years worth of service for a flat fee or something like that? right? So how is your menu structured? What does that look like? And you might have a blended model. You might have some packages and then some a la carte items. That's totally normal. What does your delivery look like? How do you bring the service or product to people? Are you a brick and mortar? Are you online only? Is it, again, a blended model? What does that look like? And then, of course, what is your hook? How do you turn interested customers into paying customers. What, what is that approach and what does that look like? Any questions on those two sections? Nothing in the chat. Okay. When you get through that, the first, the opportunity section and sales and marketing, guess what? That is the bulk of your plan. That's the meat right there. When you look down farther, it this is all factual information that doesn't require a lot of uh, necessarily thought, right? Where are you located? What is your facility, right? What's the space you're using? What kind of technology do you need? What kind of equipment and tools will you be using? The metrics and milestones table here is uh, basically setting up your goals. And then key metrics is what are you tracking that tells you your business is on track? 
Again, this is all just factual. When I go to company, what's your business structure? Are you an LLC? Are you a sole proprietor? Are you a partnership? And who are the owners and how is that uh, separated? Who's your team? Uh, and, and any advisors, this can be an accountant, your lawyer, banker, you could be uh, you know, your SBDC consultants, anyone that you are going to for additional information or input on your business. And this, the advisor section is, especially if you're going for a loan, just um, uh, shows that you're, you're doing your due diligence and that you're seeking out uh, support and information from other professionals in the industry. So it, it, it just demonstrates you're doing, doing what you're supposed to do. Okay, questions on that? Because I wanna move into forecast. We've got about 20 minutes left and I wanna spend about 10 to 15 on the forecasting area. There is nothing in the chat right now. I think everybody's waiting with bated breath for the forecasting <laughs> section. Okay. So that's the meat of your plan. Once you get that dialed in, again, the strategy is you work back to your executive summary, which is a shorter, like five section uh, part of your plan. You would pull key points out of your main plan into there, okay? All right, let's look at forecasting. So again, when you open this up, you're gonna see these tabs across the top. And what's great about these tabs is you don't have to be an accountant to make your financial projections. This part can often feel overwhelming to people. And again, my team is here to help and support you. We can walk you through this process and meet with you one-on-one -on -one for as long as you need to get this dialed in. The idea here is by going down the line in each of these sections, you are actually building a profit and loss and a balance sheet and even a cash flow statement, which are the main financial statements that you need for your business and will help you understand your profitability and um, you know, the value of your business. The balance sheet kind of shows the value and then also cash flow, which is really also very important. So you hit revenue and there's this big green button here. It says add revenue stream. And let's just say we're an, uh, an ice cream business, okay? Now I already created this line item. I typed in the name ice cream. I'm gonna do unit sales because I'm gonna sell units or ice cream cones, right? And then the next section is uh, you can choose, this is going to look confusing at first, but once you get in here and start playing around, it'll make a little bit more sense. You can choose a constant amount, which would be a flat amount that you're projecting every month or varying amounts over time. Well, ice cream, doesn't matter where you are, is typically a seasonal business, right? You're going to be selling more in, in uh, warmer temperatures than if you're in uh, winter time. So you can see here, I chose varying, and this is units. Again, this is not um, money. This is the number of ice cream cones I'm gonna sell in the month of April and May, and it's gonna total those units up. So I'm estimating, um, projecting 8,050 ice cream cone sales in my first year. And then I'm gonna establish the price of that. So I'm gonna hit next. And let's say I'm selling those for $3.50 each, okay? You can also do varying. You can also, let's say you have different kinds of ice cream cones. Well, instead of the name of the revenue just being ice cream, it's gonna be um, double dips and banana splits, and you're gonna divide it all out, right? For the purposes of this demonstration though, we're just gonna say I'm selling the same ice cream cone over and over and over for $3.50. And when I hit save, it puts that revenue stream at $28,175 a year. And then over time, I'm showing about a 5% increase year over year, which you can do again here at the final, um, sorry, in here, 
see how I went from 8,050 the first year. Well, I bumped that up to 8,800 the next year and about 9680 that following year. So you're showing growth over time. That's also really important when you're when you're working on your projections. Okay, so whatever your revenue streams are, maybe you're selling haircuts, maybe you're a service-based business, uh, maybe you're, you know, you're a manufacturing company and you're selling some kind of widget, okay? It works for anything. Revenue. The next I'm going to move on down in case there, unless there's any questions about revenue or how to enter. These, these all work the same. You're going to be entering each one of these um, tabs has a green button where you're going to add items. Yes, Marie. Can you just uh, hit that monthly detail so they can see it over on the right? Yes. Uh, right down. So you can also see this monthly detail. You can also turn that on and it'll show you what your monthly income is. Okay, and then it'll total it here in this. So you can see in June, that's my highest month, right? This is another um, great comparison because you can look at year over year numbers, okay? All right, the next section is direct costs. Not all of you are gonna have direct costs. Direct costs are different than expenses. Expenses are a little bit later and these expenses are your operational expenses like rent, utilities, insurance, marketing, things that you're paying on a regular basis, okay? Direct costs are costs that are reflective of your revenue streams or your uh, your items that you're selling. So in this case, I have to buy every time I sell, I generate a revenue for this ice cream cone. I need to use a cone, right? I have to buy, I have to have an ice cream cone for each of those uh, ice creams that I'm selling. And I want to put a cost in there that is directly related back to my ice cream sales. Because if let's just say you're a coffee shop and yeah, you sell ice cream cones, but you also sell cups of coffee. Well, you might have a revenue stream that's coffee, small coffee, right? And then you would have your coffee, your cost of the actual coffee here. So here's my ice cream cone. I enter that and it costs me 20 cents a cone for each ice cream I'm paying 20 cents of the revenue I'm pulling in is a direct cost, right? And it's what's cool about this is you could say it's a general cost or it's specific to one of my revenue streams. In this case, the cone is directly related to the sale of that ice cream. So I'm gonna pick cost of specific revenue stream and if it will calculate that amount for me. So I said, if you remember back in the revenue, I said I was gonna sell 800 cones that first month, right? So it is calculating in the first month, 800 times 20 cents is my direct cost. If I look at, see that? 20 cents for 800 cones is about $120. So that's a direct cost. That's important because, and it will require some math. I believe somebody's on the call today. I just went through this with her yesterday. Factoring in what it costs for each, each time you sell something. It does, and it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a math problem. If you need help, we can help you. Okay, so those are direct costs. Questions about direct costs. Again, some of you may not have direct costs. If you're a service-based, if you're a cleaning company, you don't have direct costs. You're not buying something and reselling it. If you're a t-shirt company in the heart of Sedona selling uh, Sedona branded t-shirts, your cost is the cost of the t-shirt, right? You're buying the t-shirt for $10, you're branding it, and then you're selling it for 30, right? The cost of that, t every time you sell that $30 t-shirt, your cost is the $10. Okay, beating a dead horse. Sorry for those that already understand direct costs. 
personnel is your people. Maybe in your first year, you don't have anybody, right? You can't afford to pay anybody. You're building your business. But maybe in the first year, you can hire a, a store manager, okay? You're going to just enter that. Again, you're going to, um, who they are, you're going to, uh, it's typically regular labor. If you're product, if you're hired somebody to do production of your widgets, it would be direct labor, but most cases it's just regular paying them an hourly wage, right? Or a salary. You can say how much each month you give them a raise every year. And then it asks for if they're on staff or maybe they're independent. What's great about this program, if they're on staff, they're on payroll, it automatically calculates your employee related expenses, which is your payroll taxes that have to be turned in every month. That's a great feature because people forget when you hire employees, you're not just paying their salaries or their wages, you have to pay those payroll taxes. And you can see it's about a third <laughs> of what you're paying them. It's not cheap to have employees, okay? Expenses, again, I mentioned this, you're gonna add line items for all of those operational expenses, insurance, rent, marketing, utilities. Maybe you're paying an accountant to help you with bookkeeping so much a month. Again, you can look at the monthly detail to see about what that costs. There's some items missing here. So don't think this is an exhaustive list you might have um, you know, licenses and permits every year. You might have, uh, you may also wanna include um, credit card fees. You know, that's about 3% every time you, you uh, collect credit card payment, you're losing about 3%, right? You wanna include that as an operational expense. Assets, these are things that either you're purchasing with the loan you're about to get or that you already have. Long-term assets typically show up on your balance sheet. So for the ice cream company, maybe I have one of those handy dandy ice cream dispensers, right? And I paid money for it. Anything that's depreciable could be a, you know, a computer, could be a printer, could be a CNC lathe, um, if you're a manufacturing company, you know, it could be a, a truck or a hauling trailer. If you're a dumpster company, whatever the case may be, those assets need to be listed here so that they show up on your balance sheet and build value for your business. Tax rates. You can just, again, hit the set tax rates. This is income taxes versus sales tax. If you're a service-based business, you wouldn't necessarily collect sales tax. If you are retail um, business based in Sedona, you need to check the, the sales tax rate there and make sure you're entering that correctly, depending on where your business is located. Dividends. This is a, um, something uh, worthy of discussing, which is if, you, if you're the owner, you don't necessarily have to put yourself on payroll, especially in the first year or two, a great way to pay yourself because you may only be able to pay yourself what's kind of left at the end of the, of the day, right? So one month you may have 500 bucks left to pay yourself and maybe another month you've got $10,000 you can pull from to pay yourself. So what's nice about this dividend section is you can put your owner draw in here and then any income that you pay yourself, you would just pay personal income taxes on your personal tax return or set up quarterly tax payments for yourself so that you're sure to be on time with your. We can talk more about dividends. I'm gonna quickly move through the last two sections. Uh, are there any questions, Marie, coming through? No, not right now. Okay, cash flow assumptions. If you are um, you know, uh, a retail company and you're purchasing items for resale, you just wanna set this up these charts to say, okay, when somebody buys something from me, they have 30 days to pay me. Or maybe you don't run your business that way at all. Maybe you don't have any, it's just, if you buy something, you pay the day that you sell it, then you would have zero sales on credit. Maybe you're blended. 
And if you are blended, how many days do people have to pay you? Okay. What you really want to work towards here as a business owner is fewer days in between the time you sell something and you get paid, but then, you know, what do your purchases look like? Maybe you're buying ingredients and you have 30 days to pay the vendor, or maybe you can stretch it out and say, can I be on net 45, which would mean you have 45 days to pay, right? This again is really important because you want to know that you have cash coming through your business to pay your bills and to pay your payroll and all of that. And then the financing section here is if in fact you are going for a loan, you would put that loan in here and the program automatically calculates for you after you enter the terms. So you're getting an equipment loan, you're buying a $4,000 piece of equipment. It's 7% interest over two years, 24 months. Okay. And it will set that up in your uh, financial statements, what your payment schedule looks like and how that impacts your cash flow and impacts your um, your financials. So that's also a great tool. Maybe you have a private investor. Okay. The other quick thing I want to point out is up here in your balance sheet. Once you enter all that information, look here, you've got your profit and loss and your balance sheet completed. And I can scroll down and see, okay, here are my margins. This is what my total operating expenses look like. Here's my sal my total salaries for the year. And down here, here's my net profit. This is what's left over after I've paid all my expenses. We're looking pretty good, right? We're, we're on a, a growth path. That's good. And here in your balance sheet, there's another green button that's set starting balances. If you're an established business, business, this is where you want to go to say, I have X amount of cash in the bank. I already have three pieces of equipment worth $130,000. And it will walk you through uh, entering that information again, because you want those balances to be reflected in your current profit and loss and balance sheet. So again, as an established business, this is a great uh, tool for identifying where you are right now to a potential lender or investor. Questions on that? There's nothing in the chat. Okay. That is a very quick overview of the live plan tool. And uh, if you are feeling overwhelmed, we don't want you to feel that way. Please reach out to us and schedule an appointment and we can walk you through this one-on-one. -on -one. We're happy to do that. I'm gonna um, stop my share, analyze in whatever stage you're in. We encourage established businesses to have a plan. Established businesses can use historical financial data. So if you have a profit and loss and balance sheet, we can use that to make those three-year projections going forward. If you're a new business, we can also help you based on what we know in the market, whatever industry you're in, we can help you make those projections based on population, based on the visitors coming to the area where you wanna, where you wanna start your business, um, based on lots of other things. So. Um, if you don't have historical financial data, that's okay. We, and many banks and lenders understand that. If you're a new business, you're going to be making projections based on other information. If you feel stuck or you don't know where to start, we always suggest just choose uh, one section. You don't have to do it in order. Sometimes you might just have an idea or a quick thought. You can plug that in and come back to it later. You know, the, the plan is designed for you to kind of move in and out of sections depending on what you're working on and where you're at. I did not mention the sample plan library, so I am going to show that to you very quickly up here in the top corner of the screen. There's this question mark. If you click on that, there's First of all, getting started videos, little sh short videos that you can watch to help you understand live plan. But right here, here's the sample plan library. If I click on that, Marie, is it moving over to the, 
or do I need to? Yes, no, okay. we're there, we're there. What's great about this is these are all written plans that have been organized in different industries and you can search for your industry or something similar. There may not be a direct comparison, but you can see, let's just look at this bar and nightclub, for example, if they have all these different business plans in here that you can open and review each section. These are real business plans. You cannot cut and paste them and reuse the information, but you can review them and see how other people set up their business plans. And if you can't find a direct comparison, there may be plans that even if it's just, an, let's say you're starting a service-based business, just find another service-based sample plan to review and look at, to generate ideas on how to get started and what needs to be included in your plan. That's a really great resource. Okay, and then, um, as I mentioned, we are here to support you in creating a plan, whether you're seeking a loan, a loan or uh, access to capital, or whether you just need to bring clarity to yourself. This is us, the SBDC. We are, uh, we have 10 centers across the state of Arizona, and we have a really great expert team here in Yavapai, but we can also leverage other centers depending on the needs of your business. Yes, question. Yeah, um, we have a question in the question and answer section. Is there a significant difference between the SBDC and organizations like the ASBA? That's a great question. So um, the Small Business Development Center is actually funded by the Small Business Administration. So it's your federal tax dollars at work. The difference between our centers and the Arizona SBA is simply that our services are, are a bit different. The centers are funded by the SBA and we provide our centers or our teams provide the no cost confidential consulting to businesses of all sizes. And again, it's the SBA, the federal dollars that uh, funnel their grant funds through um, our state network and, and then across into the different centers. Um, the AZ SBA uh, provides the information coming down from the federal level, like over the pandemic, they were the ones that were like, hey, SBDCs, here's all the programs and opportunities to access capital for businesses that have been impacted by the pandemic. And then we help disperse that information. We support the businesses in their application process and to access the capital. We help them organize, we help the businesses organize their financials and um, come up with the paperwork they need to submit the application back to the SBA. So it's it's kind of part of the pipeline of information. And then we, we, have, we have slightly different services. Now, the SBA also does uh, kind of in conjunction with our services, workshops and trainings. They um, they host webinars on SBA services, but ultimately a lot of those services are are run through the, the SBDCs. Great question. Other questions? Uh, no. Okay. But people are just saying thank you. <laughs> Great. Well, just so you all know, uh, we do have a unique partnership with the Arizona Commerce Authority as well, which is a state uh, level department. They have an incredible amount of resources and provide additional support and trainings. And this is our website where you can register for our services. And I have it on this final page as well. This is, this is our team. Here's our contact information. We will be sending this information out following the training today. Again, if you are not yet a uh, client and you would like to access this live plan tool, please register for our services here at our website. Go ahead, Marie. Sorry, we have another question. Uh, do you help those interested in franchising a business? We do have resources for people wanting to franchise. So if you're that far along and you are ready uh, to look into those options and opportunities. We have other partners that have resources, and then we also have um, 
franchising resources within our network as well. So yes, please reach out. Happy to connect you. Anything else? We, I just want to say thank you all so much for joining us. We had a great group this morning. I appreciate your questions. And again, we're 